Welcome and thank you for joining us on this rather suspenseful day. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many of you uh, in these uh, circumstances. And as a matter of uh, clarification, I would like to say that this talk was originally not scheduled the day after the election. Um, we had to reschedule it once. Um, Princeton changed its academic uh, calendar due to the uh, pandemic. And so we had to reschedule the talk to uh, make it closer to the uh, schedule of the graduate seminar on Russo's politics. Although I'm sure there would be a lot of things to be said about the current events seen from a Rousseauvian lens, this is not going to be uh, the main focus of Professor Needleman's um, talk uh, today. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Jason Needleman, uh, who is a professor of political science at the University of La Verne in uh, Southern California. His research focuses on modern political theory and especially the Enlightenment, French political thought and culture, the relationship between power and ideas, and of course, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who ties all these um, different issues together. I actually met um, Professor Needleman through the Rousseau Association, of which he's the secretary and treasurer. Rousseau is uh, at the core of many of his publications, um, including uh, his two books, uh, the General Will is Citizenship, Inquiries into French Political Thought, which uh, was published in 2001, and his um, uh, most recent book, Rousseau's Ethics of Truth, A Sublime Science of Simple Cells, um, published in 2017. And Rousseau is also the subject matter of um, Professor Needleman's uh, most recent article, I believe, um, Politics and Tragedy, The Case of Rousseau, which uh, was published this year in 2020 in um, the Political Research um, Quarterly. Um, just a few uh, practical uh, uh, words. Um, I would like to thank the Department of French and Italian and uh, especially um, Professor Trezais, the chair of the department for making this possible. I would also like to thank Charles Leonardi and Kelly Eggers for um, ensuring uh, that um, all the technical aspects uh, go well. And um, after Professor Needles, Needleman's uh, talk, there will be a Q&A session. Um, so the way it works is that um, you're asked to send me a question mark in uh, through the chat uh, thread and um, we will uh, follow the, the order of uh, the, the questions. Last thing, this meeting is being recorded. So if you do not want to uh, appear on the recording, please um, uh, turn off uh, your uh, camera. This being said, uh, we're all looking forward to hearing um, Professor Needleman's talk, The Political is Personal, Rousseau's Ethics of the Self, and please join me in welcoming um, Professor Needleman. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Champy. And thank you to Kelly and to Charles. Hello to my friends from the University of Laverne and to my friends from Professor Champy's seminar in French politics from yesterday. I was thinking, I wish I would have sat in on that seminar before I wrote the book because um, the book would have been a bit better <laughs> if I had thought about some of the things that we talked about yesterday. Well, I thank you all for um, taking a break from the gnashing of teeth and the biting of fingernails and the pacing and the binge eating and whatever else you're doing to try to get through these days, the, the constant refreshing of Twitter. Um, it's, uh, it is an interesting time to be talking about uh, the 18th century. So I thought I'd give you a kind of a nicotine patch before we get into Rousseau in the 18th century. Um, you might recognize this fellow, that's uh, Walt Whitman. 
a, 18, a 19th century American poet. And in Democratic Vistas, he said this about American elections. You can see if it resonates with you. I know nothing grander, better exercise, better digestion, more positive proof of the past, the triumphant result of faith in humankind than a well-contested American national election. And we can compare that to this man, who I think we all recognize, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said of English elections, the English people believe themselves to be free. They are gravely mistaken. They are free only during election of members of parliament. As soon as the members are elected, the people are enslaved. Anyway, that's a kind of a nicotine patch to, I don't want to wean you off politics all at once, you know. Um, but I am going to ask you to um, leave that aside for a moment. I hope that in the course of my remarks, um, you will get a sense of how you feel about our politics, maybe even the election that's ongoing. Although if I had to recommend a political theorist for understanding this election, it would probably be Carl Schmitt, not Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Okay, so I'm going to talk um, about the connection between Rousseau's politics and his personal life, um, his autobiographies. That's the um, subject of this week's readings in the, in the seminar. So I thought I'd focus, drawing from my book, I thought I'd focus on the kind of connections between Rousseau's politics and his, his writings on um, his own life. I've taken as my title, The Political is Personal, which is an inversion of the well-known feminist slogan from the 1960s. I hope my reason for doing this will become clear over the course of my remarks. Rousseau was someone for whom his work and his life were intimately connected. That was really a core part of his critique of what we might now call institutionalized academia, toward which he had an at best ambivalent, and we could even say a hostile relationship. Rousseau believed that one should only write about theoretical questions to the extent that they serve a personal agenda to the extent that they improve one's life. And he thought this was one of the most important things that distinguished him from his contemporaries, who he believed mostly wrote not to secure their personal happiness, but rather to secure their reputation. They wrote in service to their amour propre. Politics, in short, for Rousseau, must be worth it personally. I happen to be teaching the Republic right now Plato's Republic, and Glaucon and Adimantus are insistent on hearing from Socrates what's in it for them, what's in this ideal just republic for them. What is it about political life that makes it personally choice worthy, um, to use uh, the, the um, Socratic language? Well, Rousseau took this question very seriously. Politics must be worth it in a personal sense, or else we're better off pursuing a, pri a private life over a public one. There is a path to redemption in politics, but only in a solidaristic republic of virtue. Virtue requires the sacrifice of particular interest to the common good. And so the only thing that could redeem politics would be the ecstasy of a communion grounded in the love of the patrie, the fraternity that flows from real Republican citizenship, real devotion to something larger than oneself. I developed many of these ideas in Rousseau's Ethics of Truth which uh, Professor Champy mentioned in, in the introduction. And I think it's useful if I talk a little bit about my reasons for writing the book. The idea for the book was born at a colloquium of the Rousseau Association that was on Rousseau's reveries. Now, because my background's in political theory, I was more familiar with Rousseau's explicitly political writings than I was with his autobiographical works. But the more I reflected on the reveries, the more it struck me that Rousseau's solitary reveries shared important and fundamental affinities with his Republic of Virtue. And yesterday I thought there were some other similar analogies that I could have drawn in the book if that's why I mentioned having uh, wished I had attended the seminar prior to completing the book. Over the next uh, 10 years or so after the conference, I pursued the intuition that I had there in developing what I refer to as an ethics of truth which animates and helps to reconcile Rousseau's famously disparate models of harmony 
and reconciliation. To be a bit more specific, the book was inspired by one particularly arresting phrase that Marcel Raymond uses in his commentary on Rousseau's reveries. That phrase is communion des coeurs, communion of hearts. In his book, Raymond claimed that the aim of Rousseau's solitary reveries was a communion of hearts. While this seemed strange at first, it eventually became clear to me that a communion of hearts was not only at the core of Rousseau's writings on politics and society, but also his writings on solitude. Although Rousseau's stated purpose in the reveries was to achieve an entirely self-sufficient, self-regarding state of consciousness, one that ceased to be dependent in any way on recognition from others, it became clear that his celebration of solitude doubled as a meditation on communion. It became clear to me that Rousseau sought in reverie something analogous to the fellowship of citizens he so famously celebrated in his political writings, like the discourses, the social contract, and the government of Poland. This realization started me thinking about the ways communion and the desire for it animated Rousseau's various attempts to theorize wholeness and reconciliation. Over the course of his literary career, Rousseau pursued a variety of such pathways, an attempt to understand and possibly recuperate the original goodness that we human beings once enjoyed but could no longer comprehend. He correspondingly produced writings in a variety of registers recommending a variety of potentially contradictory solutions to the problems that plague modern society. Now, the prospect of a kind of unifying theory of Rousseau's philosophical system, which we discussed yesterday, a system that might reconcile Rousseau's ambivalence about solitude and society, religious liberty and civil religion, particular will and general will, religion and sentiment. That kind of a reading of Rousseau has long been discounted as illusory. It is my contention in the book, however, that the texts are in fact susceptible to such an interpretation, that in reading Rousseau through the lens of communion and his preferred pathways to communion, a coherent, consistent philosophy of truth-seeking emerges. There is a symmetry that unites the communion Rousseau experienced and solitary reverie, which with the religious communion he enjoyed among what he called his brothers in Neuchâtel and the political communion he extolled in his writings on politics. There is an impulse represented in each of these experiences to become part of something larger than oneself, to extend our being, as Rousseau puts it in Emile. This impulse toward communion is manifested across the spectrum of Rousseau's writings, whether as the savages, love of existence, an immediate connection to nature, or in the citizens, love of the patrie, the solitaries, love of nature, or the philosopher's love of what Rousseau refers to as the whole human race in the Geneva manuscript, as well as in the Christian's love of her brothers. So as I said, what I thought could be useful today, given where you are, the students who are in the seminar, and what you're studying at this point in the semester, I thought I'd share some of the symmetries between Rousseau's autobiographical writings and his writings on politics. I argue in the book that there is a philosophy of truth animating Rousseau's diverse writings and that this philosophy provides coherence to what might otherwise appear to be incompatible models of reconciliation. Briefly, this philosophy can be summarized as utility, autonomy, immediacy, and simplicity in pursuit of communion. The book presents what I call a normative account of truth seeking or an ethics of truth of what human beings ought to do, what we must do, if we are to rediscover the immediate truths of human happiness known to us in, original, in our original state but now obscure to us in society. For Rousseau, the paths to truth were many, but their contours were similar. He believed that the truths essential to human happiness could be known, that they were known, but that they have been obscured by civilization, leaving most of us unhappy and morally corrupt. Nevertheless, several avenues will lead back to these truths 
for those willing to consecrate themselves to it. And this phrase, truths essential to human happiness, comes at the beginning of the first discourse and Rousseau makes much of it. He says, you know, I will answer this question. We talked yesterday about how reluctant Rousseau was to write. He had to be encouraged to write. Whether that was a pretense or not is another question, but he had to be encouraged to write. That's how he presented himself. And he said, I will respond um, to this question because it is one that pertains to the truths essential to human happiness. So the book's divided into two sections. And in the second half of the book, I trace these various, what I call pathways to truth. And I just want to note, um, because I won't have time to get into that second half of the book, that any one of these pathways can be corrupted under the influence of what Rousseau calls inflamed amour propre. Um, and, and, and when that's the case, um, they end up producing division and inequality rather than communion. But each one can also be uh, redemptive when pursued within the constraints of Rousseau's philosophy of truth seeking, which, as I say, I define as utility, autonomy, immediacy, and simplicity in pursuit of communion. And then in the second part of the book, I talk about reverie and philosophy and religion and, and politics and show how in each one of these, what Judith Schlar calls images of unity, if we hew closely to these contours, these four contours I have here on this slide, um, we can achieve a kind of uh, communion and we can either um, transcend amor prop or generalize it in a way that it is uh, conducive to the kind of communion that Rousseau valued. So you may have noticed on the original slide, uh, this Latin phrase vitam impendere vero, which uh, means consecrate life to truth or dedicate life to truth. Uh, Rousseau in the late 1750s adopted this as his personal motto. It's from a, a poem by Juvenal. And um, I think it's very important. Um, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, Rousseau's philosophy was an intensely personal one. That's what I try to emphasize in the title of my lecture. And when he talked about consecrating life to truth, he meant that in a personal way. He meant that to highlight the thing, the most important thing that he thought differentiated him from um, others of his time who were writing on similar subjects. So Rousseau criticized the philosophy as of his contemporaries as overly detached. He criticized them for failing to consecrate their lives to truth. And as a consequence, he criticized them for failing to offer guidance to those concerned to, the to, to discover the truths essential to human happiness. And I wanted to share some passages with you. I, I, I saw yesterday that Professor Champ likes these close readings. I do too. This is, this is from The Reveries, um, which encapsulates this, this critique. Rousseau writes, I have seen many who philosophized much more learnedly than I, but their philosophy was, so to speak, foreign to them. Wanting to be more knowledgeable than others, they studied the universe in order to know how it was ordered. Just as they would have studied some machine, they might have perceived through pure curiosity. They studied human nature to be able to speak knowingly about it, but not in order to know themselves. They toiled in order to instruct others, but not in order to enlighten themselves within. And I'll just note that the uh, citations here come from the Pleiad first, and then Masters and Kelly uh, second. So I start here because for Rousseau, it's very important that one bring a certain disposition towards scholarly inquiry. His autobiog autobiographies can be read as his attempt to demonstrate that whatever his personal flaws, and we talked about them yesterday, Rousseau was a man who had this kind of sensibility. And, and that's part of what can, allows him to admit to those personal faults because underlying it all is this faith he has in his own goodness. And we saw that at the beginning of, of uh, the confessions yesterday. So this is what I mean by approaching truth as an ethical problem, a problem of the self. And again, Rousseau was at pains to distinguish his approach to truth, approach to truth and truth seeking from others. And many times he, he, he uh, 
denies that he should even be called a philosopher or that what he's doing could be called philosophy. One of my favorite instances where he does this is in one of these letters we discussed yesterday where he's defending himself against uh, public officials and priests who are accusing him of, of blasphemy. And this, this, is, this is from the Correspondence Complete. I, I'm not, I think it's to, I, it's either to Créqui or Formé, I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, he writes, you are quite correct, my dear sir, to say that I am not a philosopher. But when you accuse me of not being a philosopher, it is as though you were accusing me of not being a master of dance. I never aspired to become a philosopher. I was never given to such things. I was not one, nor am I one, nor do I want to be one. And he denies this other places as well. Here to Forme, sir, you believe me to be a philosopher and I am not one at all. And then to Kreiki, I have never made a great case for philosophy and I am absolutely detached from the party of philosophers who we discussed yesterday with reference to the, to the dialogue. So Juvenal's imperative to consecrate oneself to truth, vita man pendere vero, was for Rousseau as much about happiness as it was about truth because the truths essential to human happiness are the only truths that matter. A detached interest in truth could be instrumentally useful from time to time as dictated by the demands of happiness, whether public or private happiness. But truth seeking must never be divorced from the ethical imperative of happiness, either public or private. It is for this reason that I refer to Rousseau's philosophy of truth as an ethics of truth, more in the tradition of Socrates' model of truth seeking than in the tradition of Frege or Bertrand Russell's analytical philosophy. The value of philosophy lay for Rousseau in what Kierkegaard would later call existence, as opposed to what Kierkegaard referred to as abstraction. So I just wanna take a moment to mention Rousseau's fundamental principle because my argument depends on it. You're probably all very familiar with this already. Um, he repeats it in several places. Um, in Emile, everything is good as it leaves the hands of the author of things. Oh, misspelling, sorry. Everything degenerates in the hands of man. And then in the dialogue, nature made man happy and good, but society depraves him and makes him miserable. In the letter to Beaumont, and similarly in Emile, let us set down this incontestable maxim, the first movements of nature are right. And finally, man is naturally good, and it is only by institutions that men become bad in, in the letter to Maleb. We are good by nature and we become corrupt in society. And, and the corruption in society Rousseau describes through this concept of amour propre, which is again, Rousseau scholars will be very familiar with this, although there's been a lot of recent scholarship kind of complicating our understanding of it, to distinguishing between benign amour propre and, um, and, and inflamed amour propre. I understand amour propre simply as self-esteem derived from the esteem of others or esteeming oneself based on how you believe you are being esteemed by others or perceived by others. Now, Rousseau generally characterizes this, characterizes this in pejorative terms, but he sometimes praises it when amour propre is sufficiently generalized such that we value ourselves based on our collective participation in a solidaristic project. And I suppose if we go back to the original slide on the election, that's what would redeem politics if we had that kind of feeling coming out of the election, maybe closer to what Whitman describes than what Rousseau says there about, about the English. It is in large part the desire to appear refined, to live through the eyes of others that leads to our alienation from the simple truths of human happiness. These simple truths, which were known immediate, immediately to us in our natural state, now lie buried under the weight of civilization. In order to recover them, it will be necessary to jettison the discourse of modern intellectualism and reclaim what Rousseau called the sublime science of simple souls in the Discourse in Arts and Sciences, and that's what I take as the subtitle of, of my book, uh, Rousseau's Ethics of Truth. 
Rousseau was not concerned to debate esoteric questions that preoccupy academic philosophers, questions like does truth exist or can we know the truth? These were not Rousseau's questions. He accepted on faith both the existence of truth and its susceptibility to human understanding. His was therefore more an ethics of truth, an account of what modern post-lapsarian human beings must do in order to recapture basic truths essential to their happiness. And my answer to that question, my answer to the question of what we must do is communion, secure communion, a kind of solitary communion that doesn't depend on the exploitation of others. It's grounded not in inequality, but in equality. And I argue in the book that Rousseau's writings can be productively approached as an exploration of the desire to commune or uh, alternately an account of the origin, corruption, and possible rehabilitation of the desire to commune. While the drive to communion is most evident in Rousseau's political writings, it is also a prominent theme in his writings on solitude, religion, moral education, as well as in his epistolary novel, in which an idealized communion is depicted even in the midst of a frustrated love affair. I'll give you an example from the Nouvelle Louise, from, from Julie, from that epistolary novel, in which the protagonist, Julie, describes her life on the Clarence estate. I'm surrounded by all those I care about. For me, all of creation is here. I enjoy at once the attachment I have for my friends, that which they return to me, that which they have for each other. Their mutual solicitude either emanates from me or relates to me. Everything I see is an extension of my being and nothing divides it. It resides in all that surrounds me. No portion of it remains far from me. There is nothing left for my imagination to do. There is nothing for me to desire, to feel, and to enjoy are to me one and the same. I live all at once, and all those I love, I am sated with happiness and life. And uh, we had a bit of a battle yesterday between the Confessions and the Nouvelle Louise, not that they have to compete, but I, I said that lots of times political theorists prefer the long kind of philosophical passages of the Nouvelle Louise. This is a good example. Um, I've actually heard a case made that um, you get the best account of Rousseauian citizenship in Julie. If you want to have a sense of what it would mean to live in a Republic of Virtue, um, the, 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 actually the best text is, uh, is La Nouvelle Louise. The same phenomenon recurs in Rousseau's most sublime evocations of Christian piety, the essence of which is expressed in the silent acceptance of communion. Rousseau's various interventions into theological debates or the politics of religious conflict are guided by the desire for communion, or he often uses the, the, the word rassemblement, rassemblement to describe the way, um, the kind of imperative, a religious imperative to bring people together. When accused of violating Christian principles, as he very frequently was, especially after the publication of Emile, Rousseau generally tried to circumvent thorny doctrinal questions and appeal instead to a few basic tenets which could unite a diversity of believers. I especially like the way he puts it in a letter from this period to the Abbé de Carondelet. It is very true that without wholly sharing the sentiment of my brothers and without disguising my own in the process, I have accommodated myself very well to theirs. I do not argue at all about the rest, which seems hardly important to me. While waiting to know with certainty who among us is right, and as long as they suffer my company in their communion, I will continue to live there in true attachment. Truth for us is covered by a veil, but peace and unity are certain. There is much that human beings do not know and indeed cannot know. This is why it's so important to focus on those few truths that we can know and that are essential to our happiness. Since we cannot know so many things, Rousseau disparaged many of the specialized debates in theology and philosophy. They're at best futile, he thought, and at worst destructive insofar as they undermine those few truths that are essential to human happiness. What can be known with certainty in Rousseau's view is that communion is a terminal good, that it is universally pursued, and that it is essential to our happiness. From this starting point, Rousseau concluded 
that doctrinal disputes ought to be avoided when possible and resolved ecumenically when necessary so as to be maximally inclusive. These passages are indicative of Rousseau's general disposition to the problem of otherness. Rousseau's theology, like his theory of language and music, is driven by the ethical political imperative for communion. Religion must serve communion to be worthy of our reverence. The recuperation of communion means confronting the prevalence of inflamed amour propre. One possibility is to withdraw from society, to lead a primarily private life in which we pursue communion in relationship with nature, with intimates, and with God. The other possibility is a radically public one by which the subject embraces the energy of amour propre instead of trying to resist it. Although amour propre generally manifests as the antithesis of amour de soi, which Rousseau saw as largely benign or entirely benign, although amour propre generally manifests as the antithesis of amour de soi, it is potentially an extension of it in a well-ordered polity. This becomes a possibility when love of oneself is derived from membership in a larger order, rather than from a specific preference for oneself as distinct from a larger order. In the letter to D'Alembert, Rousseau describes how communion might ideally manifest itself in social life. In this essay, which is a detailed critique of the role that the theater played in the corruption of European morals, Rousseau once again recalls the immediacy of ancient communion, this time as an aspirational ideal. This is from the letter to D'Alembert, a very famous passage. Rousseau writes, let us not adopt these exclusive entertainments, which close up a small number of people in melancholy fashion in a gloomy cavern, which kept them fearful and immobile in silence and in action, which give them only prisons, lances, soldiers, and afflicting images of servitude and inequality to see. No, happy peoples, these are not your festivals. It is in the open air under the sky that you ought to, ought to gather and give yourselves to the sweet sentiment of your happiness. Plant a stake crowned with flowers in the middle of a square, gather the people together there and you will have a festival. Do better yet, let the spectators become an entertainment to themselves, make them actors themselves. Do it so that each sees and loves himself in the others so that all will be better united. Here Rousseau envisions the recuperation of the savage's sentiment of existence, now in the context of a simple gathering of like-minded compatriots. In Rousseau's imagined festival, erstwhile passive observers become active participants, integrated rather than detached. Their involvement felt rather than intellectualized. As Rousseau had previously said, of Southern languages, of the savages, sentiment of existence, and of the civic fellowship prevalent in ancient Sparta and Rome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Until he withdrew from society late in life, Rousseau held that patriotism alone, he wrote in the government of Poland, patriotism alone among all of the sentiments could overcome the divisions attendant to modern society. Only patriotism, Rousseau wrote, could raise men up above themselves. Later in life, however, in the reveries, Rousseau claimed to have discovered another pathway to this kind of communion. And while this pathway, which we might call solitary communion, initially seems to be the opposite of social communion, it too involves an extension of being and the transcendence of one's putative limitations. It was a great irony of Rousseau's life that having done so much to extol the virtues of political and religious fellowship, he was himself rarely in a position to enjoy either one. After decades spent trying to find a community that would have him and that he could consider worthy of himself, Rousseau eventually abandoned society altogether and began to think and write about the virtues of solitude. In so doing, however, Rousseau did not abandon his quest to extend his being, his desire to enjoy the ecstasies of communion. When he entered his period of extended exile, Rousseau was initially concerned that he would have no way to extend his being. However, amidst his own solitude, he discovered that there is an equally sublime path uh, 
and he ends up actually saying it's even better, even better than social communion, this kind of solitary communion. Uh, an equally uh, sublime path to communion available to those who are outside of society. And this path follows a pattern that Rousseau laid out in a meal through which a meal's education initially requires uh, very tight boundaries. It's highly circumscribed in order for the soul to expand in a way that feeds it, that um, produces this kind of um, ecstasy of communion. We can see this in a letter Rousseau wrote to Malherbe from the, the period of, of his, uh, that he spent on the Ile Saint-Pierre on the, uh, where he composed the reveries, where Rousseau explained uh, that even in solitude, he was not alone for long. My imagination did not leave the earth adorned this way, deserted for very long. I soon peopled it with beings in accordance with my heart and driving opinion, prejudices, all factitious pas passions very far away into these refuges of nature. I transported men worthy of inhabiting them. He finally found the place that was up to his standards and it was in his own imagination. Continuing, he writes, from them I formed a charming society for myself of which I did not feel myself to be unworthy. When uh, Rousseau uh, wrote the reveries, he uh, pursued not only this kind of communion in his imaginary um, republic of virtue, but he also pursued a communion with nature. And there's a, um, many, um, many fascinating passages where Rousseau describes this kind of frustrated attempt to secure this communion with nature. He comes upon a stocking mill and the, 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 the visitors keep pestering him. And it's interesting to read about his so-called solitude because you find out that he's actually surrounded by many people, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll give him a generous read. And um, he describes kind of a moment when he had attained it floating on a raft in, um, in the middle of the lake. Uh, and uh, again, a famous passage from the reveries. When evening approached, I would come down from the heights of the island and gladly go sit in some hidden nook along the beach at the edge of the lake. There the no noise of the waves and the tossing of the water captivating my senses and chasing all other disturbance from my soul plunged it into a delightful reverie in which night would often surprise me without my soul having noticed it, without my having noticed it. The ebb and flow of this water and its noise, continual but magnified at intervals, striking my ears and eyes without respite, took the place of the internal movements which reverie extinguished within me and was enough to make me feel my existence with pleasure and without taking the trouble to think. From time to time, some weak and short reflection about the instability of things in this world arose, an image brought on by the surface of the water. But soon these weak impressions were erased by the uniformity of the continual movement which lulled me and which without any active assistance from my soul held me so fast that called by the hour and agreed upon signal, I could not tear myself away without effort. Here Rousseau describes communing with his surroundings becoming one with the world, feeling his own existence and nature simultaneously and immediately. He melts into a perfect communion reminiscent of the citizen who relinquishes some of his private liberty in order to become part of an indivisible whole. Despite finding himself alone at the end of his life, Rousseau continued to believe, as he put it uh, in, in uh, the reveries, that our sweetest existence is relative and collective that, as he put it in the dialogue, the most social, that he was the most sociable and most loving of humans. In the dialogue Rousseau, uh, the Rousseau character brings together the solitaire and the inhabitants of what he calls this ideal world, who Rousseau writes, following his profound views reach almost the same goal by the opposite route. So the solitaire and the inhabitants of these ideal world come to the same goal, which I'm describing as communion by what Rousseau describes as the op opposite route. And I kind of take that metaphor of the route 
uh, and, and use that in the second half of, of the book to describe these various routes or pathways to communion. In Rousseau's political writings, a communion des coeurs meant a love of the patrie. Reverie was in part Rousseau's way of resigning himself to his failure as a citizen, a concession that happiness was no longer possible for him in society. But it also surprised him with a new way to commune with the hearts of other human beings. Gaston Bachelard writes of reverie, Rousseauian reverie, uh, quote, il n'y a plus de non moi, unquote. There is no longer not me, or there is, I don't know, is that right? <laughs> Am I translating that right? Something like that. There is no more not me, or there's, there is nothing, yeah. We lose ourselves in communion. We lose ourselves with our surroundings, just as we do amidst our compatriots in a republic of virtue. Reverie and patriotism, it turns out, are opposite paths to the same basic truth of human happiness. In Emile, Rousseau famously wrote that one must choose between making a man and a citizen because it is not possible to, quote, make both at the same time, unquote. Rousseau shows that whichever choice one makes, the fundamental task will be the same, an initial inward turn followed by a return to the world, no longer to master it or to distinguish oneself in it, but to order oneself to it. Patriotism or social communion draws on amour propre to generalize love of oneself, such that citizens serve those interests they share with their fellow citizens. Reverie or solitary communion draws on amour de soi, such that we rediscover the cosmopolitan love of existence that unites all human beings. The two paths to communion come together in a meal, in which Rousseau demonstrates how a child can be raised for either one or both, for either social communion solitary communion, or both. Emile will be capable of ordering his soul to a larger order, whether he is alone or in society. That's, that, that, that's the ambition anyway. You, you, if you read Emile and Sophie, it doesn't quite work out that way. So I know you're reading Rousseau's autobiographies now. And Rousseau in the Confessions acknowledges the centrality of communion to the life that he's lived. He makes this connection that I allude to in my title between the political and the personal. He says that he pursued communion not only in his writings but in his personal life as well. And I'll share um, this passage from the Confessions. Rousseau writes, the first of my needs, the greatest, the strongest, the most inextinguishable was entirely in my heart. It was the need for an intimate society and as intimate as it could be. This peculiar need was such that the closest union of bodies could not even be enough for it. I would have needed two souls in the same body. Is one of the pleasures of studying Rousseau is you get to read passages like that. It's often seen as ironic that someone, Rousseau, who was so eloquent about the need to connect to other human beings, wrote of discovering happiness only in exile from them. What I try to show in the book is that this is not as ironic as it seems, that these aren't so different after all. He says something similar in the reveries, in spite of my efforts, my expansive soul seeks to extend its feeling and existence to other beings. So I don't wanna to take too much time. I, I would say a little bit about, um, a little, something a little bit explicit about my interpretation of, of um, Rousseau's political theory, if there's, if there's time, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, I would say five minutes so we can have time for the Q and A. Perfect, perfect. So I mentioned that the way we do this is through, at least on my account, pursuing the contours of these various pathways to truth, 
which I refer to as utility, autonomy, immediacy, and simplicity. And just because it's a class on Rousseau's politics, I thought I'd say a word about my kind of idiosyncratic interpretation of Rousseau's politics, of, about Rousseau's uh, republicanism. Now, Rousseau's political theory, especially as explained in the social contract, is written in a distinctive style. I mentioned that Rousseau always wrote in response to an urgent personal necessity or claims that he did. The social contract doesn't appear to adhere to that injunction in the way that the other texts do. But the Rousseau of the social contract, I argue, and of the political writings more generally, especially, offers more than what Rousseau says in the subtitle to the social contract is principles of political right. No doubt this political theory offers an account of principles of political right, of formal institutions of legitimate governance. But my argument is that these formal institutions are themselves instrumental to the recuperation of this immediate sentiment of existence that we had in the natural state and that we're seeking to recover in society. Political institutions that serve liberty and equality are to be guaranteed, Rousseau argued, not because they're our birthright, or not only because they're our birthright, but also because they are preconditions to a communion of hearts and a republic of, of virtue. And here I'll just mention Bronislaw Bashko's work because uh, it's been translated into French from Polish, but someone should translate it, I would argue, into English. It makes an important contribution highlighting the centrality of communion that I think is lacking in the Anglophone literature. Rousseau believed that the best political institutions would operate negatively, just as good education does, break down barriers to unmediated communion, and allow us then to re-engage with one another in a way that we experience the ecstasy of communion in a solidaristic republic of virtue. If successful, we will have created a political space in which citizens can make politics preferable to solitude. But if we can't, if we can't create a just and ennobled political life, which would be the surest path to happiness, if you could do it, but if we can't, then Rousseau preferred a private life to a public one. If a political life cannot be a happy one, it should be eschewed in favor of a private one. And then I have a technical argument where I try to make this case. Um, but I'm going to stop there. Maybe we can talk about it in the in in the Q and A. Um, and I just um, thank you so much again for for having me. And um, I really enjoyed it. Look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jason, for uh, for this uh, talk. And I'm sure. I mean, I have many questions, but since I'm the host, I'll try to keep my mouth um, shut for now. Uh, so the, the audience can ask question, questions. Um, so just a reminder of how um, this works in the Zoom world. Uh, please send me a question mark um, through the chat uh, thread and, um, uh, and uh, then you can ask your question. So um, I see that Pierre, Pierre Azou has a, a, a question. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Champy, and thank you very much, Professor Niederman. Uh, can't see you, right? Oh, here you are. Uh, so our upcoming um, graduate conference will be on the theme of sacrifice, and I couldn't help but think of uh, sacrifice as you were talking, and you did um, use the term once. So I guess my general question is just to invite you to bring it in, um, bring, bring in you know, sacrifice in uh, the... Um, what you um, uh, what you played out, and but I would um, just to uh, kind of uh, start you, um, get you started, I guess. Uh, um, I'll just offer you uh, the way I'm thinking about the, the problem and offer like a particular problem to uh, bring in sacrifice. Um, and I would like to do so by there is this quote in um, Les Rêveries, uh, du Promeneur Solitaire, 
uh, which I keep going back to, and I would love to have your um, comments on the quote. So in French, it goes, j'aurais aimé les hommes malgré eux-mêmes ou contre eux-mêmes, ils n'ont pu qu'en qu cessant de l'être se dérober à mon affection. So translated, you would go something like, I would have loved my fellow human beings even in spite of themselves, and it's only because they have ceased to be humans that uh, I have had to um, run away from them or leave them. Um, so, and I wonder how, you know, if you take two situations, like in the ancient states, Rousseau calls for heroism and supposedly self-sacrifice. He praises, you know, the, the, the Spartan for sacrificing himself for, the, uh, for, for, for his um, city state. Uh, but I would assume that in a modern state, the fallen state, Rousseau would say that because the society is an evil one, then the self cannot sacrifice himself for this uh, society because that would be uh, defining, the, defining the self. So I wonder what, you know, what, what does Rousseau very practically, what would he have done in a situation where he would have had to decide on whether do I sacrifice myself to my uh, patrie, to my community, or, or not, you know? And, I, uh, and I'm just thinking of, you know, it's in 20th century, and I'll stop with that. In the 20th century, um, an inheritor of Rousseau, Monterland, was filled with, you know, heroism and big notions of, you know, sacrifice and everything. But in effect, when the Second World War came, he was so, um, um, he despised his fellow countrymen so much along the lines, you know, of Rousseau's quote, that he didn't, he didn't uh, join the resistance and he stayed on his own. And, uh, you know, he, he just acted like a coward, basically. So I'm just, yeah, how can Rousseau help us with that? And isn't there some kind of conundrum here for, for, for his uh, uh, thoughts? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you to connect the passage from the reveries to the idea of sacrifice, but now I understand what you mean. And I mean, I think you sort of led us to the answer, which is, and it's not going to be satisfying, but that Rousseau would love to lay down his life for the, the, the patria, for the fatherland, if only he had been surrounded by fellow citizens worthy of the name. And that uh, passage from the reveries that you quote is his kind of lament that it, it's, it's not my fault. I, I, I would have been a great citizen, but these people, you all let me down. You know, <laughs> you, you didn't give me a republic that was worthy of that kind of sacrifice. But I think we should, and, and this I would defer to, to, to the people who, who know the confessions better than me, but I think we should absolutely be skeptical of that kind of a thing because we know that over the course of his life, However well Rousseau wrote about self-sacrifice or heroism, he was never himself personally heroic or never himself made sacrifices for the extent, unless someone can correct me, but that was something that um, he, he wasn't able to do. So he's among our best at extolling the ecstasies of membership in this kind of a, 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 of a solid juristic republic, but him, never could him bring himself to do it. So I think you're pointing to a tension that um, is, is absolutely real, but, the, the, in a theoretical sense, we can answer the question as to why uh, we would be willing to sacrifice. And that is um, because as he puts it in, in, the, in political economy, in the third discourse, he says, uh, and this is, you know, you're studying the confession. So, you know, this is a big admission for Rousseau. He says, um, the, the love of the fatherland is sweeter even than the love of a mistress. So the reason you would be willing to, uh, and you know how he felt about mistresses because you're reading the, the confessions. Um, the reason you'd be willing to sacrifice is because, and this is, like I say, I think this is a little bit missing in the Anglophone interpretations of Rousseau's political science. Um, the reason you would do it is because that kind of sublime communion that you get from the solidarity with, with, it, it, with virtuous citizens um, makes you glad of the sacrifice. And just, just as you would be in, in, a, in, a, in a affair of the heart. You're glad to make whatever sacrifice you need to because the rewards um, make it the exchange uh, worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, for um, the question. Um, Jonathan, I see you have a, a question.
Yes, hello. Thank you, Professor Shemphi, for arranging the lecture, and thank you, Professor Needleman, for uh, coming to class yesterday and all of your fascinating contributions and for the lecture today as well. I, I have a question for you based on one of the uh, final remarks you made in your lecture where you said that um, what comes first for Rousseau is to create a politics that's suitable for communion. And if that isn't possible, if I'm quoting you correctly, then one must retreat from politics to become happy uh, into the self, into private life. And I, I'm wondering how you might reconcile that with the uh, example of Rousseau's own life, the way that he presents himself in the confessions, where it seems like at the very same time as he's writing about the duties of man, I believe in the second discourse, he describes that he's undertaking this whole personal reform. And part of that personal reform, again, at the very same time as he's thinking about the political, is this retreat, um, where he says, for instance, that he plans to shake off the yoke of friendship, as an example. Um, so perhaps the insight that you're coming to is something that occurs later in Rousseau's career rather than at that early stage, but it, it does seem to me just from a few instances in the Confessions, which we've read in class, that these two elements that you're developing were almost being um, conceived of simultaneously. Yeah, I mean, I, no, I think that's a consistent theme throughout his life and his writings, this tension between the deep desire to be a virtuous citizen and a complete personal inability to ever manage it. And again, the way that's resolved, uh, as Pierre mentioned, is this at the end anyway, is to kind of um, blame everyone else that they weren't kind of worthy of the kind of republic that, that, would, um, that would be sufficiently redemptive to justify that kind of sacrifice. I don't know if I'm, if I'm answering your question or if I'm, I'm hearing you correctly, but I think that's a tension that we can trace throughout the whole of Rousseau's work and life. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna hide behind this, but Rousseau does say on several <laughs> occasions, uh, you know, I, I am a man of paradox. It is necessary to make them when one thinks. So I, I don't wanna say that as a way of kind of, um, evading your question, but I do think that when we study Rousseau, we very quickly become implicated in these kinds of contradictions and paradoxes. And that is absolutely one, that the man who maybe did more or about as much as anyone to extol the pleasures of citizenship was himself um, a failure as a citizen. Um, and and um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, opted for, for the most part, what he believed was the only thing available to him, which was something like that personal regimen that, that you describe. As a um, follow-up to, to that, and before we move on to the next um, question, um, I, I would like to highlight one of Rousseau's um, best known paradoxes, which is that at the same time, that he's writing the second discourse, uh, he is um, undertaking this personal reform, changing his outfit for a poorer um, outfit, outfit uh, selling his watch so he doesn't have to um, care about uh, what time it is uh, anymore. But also at the same time, while before he had abandoned his uh, children without even thinking of it, uh, as soon as he's writing the second discourse and undertaking this reform, he continues abandoning these children, but out of a deliberate reflection, because he thinks that these children will be better off by being educated publicly rather than being educated by himself, which is a rather, which is a rather puzzling um, idea. But you know, I don't. I know. can't take that seriously. I, do you? I I I take that as just a pure act of self-justification that can't be justified beyond the moment. You know, the confessions in written in the style of, um, you know, admission, you know, of admitting fault. And, and I almost feel like even making that argument is a kind of admission that he had failed because he had to resort to, yeah, the 
invocation of Plato and the communion of women and children. It did. I don't. I'm not persuaded. I don't know about you. Are you? And this is when he starts dressing in like a Turkish clothing, right? Uh, um, I think that Turkish later. Uh, clothing is a little later, um, yeah. but uh, I'm not so. I'm not so sure. But yeah, it's an interesting. Um, and there are some interesting um, paradoxes in uh, in Rousseau's um, in uh, Rousseau's uh, life and writing, of course. Um, Chloe, you you're next in line. Yes, thank you very much. And it's also about a paradox. And I'm sorry because I'm going to ask a question on um, Rousseau's autobiographical writings, and it's in that you're more into his political writings. But um, how how do you see the fact that um, the Confessions and and later on the Reverie and before that the Dialogue um, contributed to actually not achieve any communion communion but isolate Rousseau um, and especially the first uh, half of the Confessions I think uh, contributed to that um, to his isolation isolation quite quite a lot. So how do you explain this paradox and? A second question would be um, about truth and uh, his confessions and his confessions are, um, I mean, what is or what are the confessions if not the place where uh, that, like that epitomizes the, the truth of the self, like where you speak yourself as um, uh, in, in the full truth. I'm sorry, I'm a little um, confused here, but can you can you maybe see how the pathways to to truth that you identify that you identified in your book um, can can they be applied to the confessions? Uh, would you see that as a, a possibility? And uh, if yes, could you say a little bit more about it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, with respect to the first question. Well, I suppose we could say that um, the longing for society will be that much greater and deeper in someone who desires it so much and is never able to, to achieve it. Maybe, I do know that, that he, I mean, one thing that, you know, we, we know that Rousseau felt about himself, but I, I, I actually think it's, it's correct. Um, because of his background and because of, how he struggled in the way that he details um, early in the confessions. He believed that he was able to bring a perspective to questions that others couldn't see. I mean, I, I really think he thought that um, the reason he experienced the revelation um, on, on the road to Vincent, the illumination, was because of who he was. He wasn't like the others um, in that they were, you know, Again, how much you want to, of this you want to believe is up to you, but that he wasn't a kind of a you know man of society and cultured and and and, and you know um, and you know influenced by inflamed amour propre. He was the savage in society. He was the ancient among the moderns, and so on. So, I mean, that would be my intuition. Would be to answer your first question that way. That it's the kind of um, special vantage point that he has by virtue of all that he suffered over the course of his life. And we talked in class yesterday about how you know, Rousseau really did live an interesting life and he did suffer a lot of hardships. And it makes for a compelling story in the Confessions. And so maybe that's how we can begin to answer your, your second question. And we talked about this yesterday too, that um, what, what I see Rousseau doing, and here I think I'm stealing Professor Sean P's book manuscript, but what I see Rousseau doing in the Confessions is laying himself bare, he thinks he's doing this, laying himself bare for all to see. And, and um, he believes that if he does that and he, if he's able to do it in an honest way, he will create a model for others to cultivate the kind of life he's led. Now, not all of the specifics, because that's idiosyncratic to him. And he admits all over the place that these, you know, I have these strange perversions and proclivities and, and you won't have those. But if you lead a life that is consecrated to truth in this way, where what you, the, the voice that you follow is the voice of your, your, your heart. Uh, he, he constantly uses this phrase, sentiment intérieur, 
that it just appears over and over and over. And he opposes people who, who follow reason, especially you know, discursive reason, to people who listen to their sentiment intérieur or to their heart. That's another word over and over and over. He opposes people who you know, listen to their reason to people who listen to their heart. And if you listen to your heart, if you follow your sentiment intérieur, um, then there's a chance that you, know, you will achieve the kind of happiness that's, that's worthy of a human being. Um, and I guess, yeah, so the way I see the confessions coming at it from this more philosophical um, point of view is as a kind of a model of how that could be done. Thank you so much. Um, so I have uh, one question and I would like to, uh, I mean, I have at least one question. Um, and uh, I'm reminded that if you want to add more questions, please send me a question mark in the uh, chat thread. But I would like to go back to this notion of communion, um, communion as a way to achieve um, uh, to achieve pol uh, political uh, unity or communion as a way to um, uh, turn the, the body politic into a live body, communion as uh, the life of the body politic. This is an extremely peculiar way um, to see because I think that the most uh, classical and traditional account of what it means to have a living body politic is to put some conflict in it. This is what you see in the Roman Republic with the, you know, the, uh, the conflict between the fundamental conflict between the plebs and the Senate. This is also what uh, Machiavelli is uh, theorizing. This is what Montesquieu is theorizing that if you want to have, you know, a safe a model of checks and balances, you need to have different you know, social bodies that in, in a sense have to agree on some common ground, grounds, but also have to fight uh, to uh, keep the body politic uh, alive. And in a sense, this is also what we see today. And I don't want to forcefully come back to uh, today's election, but what we see today is a country that is deeply divided. And it seems that the two camps are only um, living as a reaction to the other. Like they, 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 you know, they put forward some arguments that are very often only a reaction to the excesses of the other camp. Um, so uh, could, you, could you explain us a little more how Rousseau plans to use communion as a way to keep the body politic alive? And do you honestly think that this could be a model um, for today? Wow. Okay. You are getting at so many of the key debates in political theory on, in Rousseau studies. Um, the answer is no, I don't think it's a model. Uh, um, it, I, I just recently wrote an essay on um, Rousseau and, and evil. And, um, you know, the, most of the time when we think about the origin of evil, we think of it as coming from you know, a defect, um, a inclination or proclivity to abuse others for one's own interest. That's, that's how Rousseau understood it. That's putting the interest of oneself above others is how he understood evil. Um, and what I say at the end of, of, of that essay is that, well, Rousseau's probably one of the best on, on, on evil as uh, you know, um, a persistent problem in society and, and, and analyzing the various ways in which we have of subjugating the interests of society to our own or privileging ourselves over others. He's great on that, but there's another origin of evil, which is a kind of insistence on purity. And that might even be more dangerous. And, and um, there Rousseau's not so good. Because for him, in order to have this republic of virtue um, that he imagined, society has to be relatively homogenous. It, it has to be relatively small. So I actually don't think that, um, I mean, I think there's a lot of lessons that we can take from Rousseau's political theory for our political life, but I don't think 
this republic of virtue that he imagines has much to tell us um, about the kind of large, diverse, multi-ethnic societies, the nation states that we most of us live in today. So um, that's just the very beginning of, of, uh, of an answer to your, to your question. But I do think um, we have to think about not just how particularity and a preference for oneself over others can damage society, which Rousseau, I, as I say, I think is one of the best at theorizing, but we have to also think about the ways in which a kind of a imperative, a kind of a, a insistence on unity can be an origin of cruelty as well. And there I think Rousseau is, is not so good. Although if we really get into it, yes, I think he has a defense to this criticism and, and I, you know, I allude to it a little bit in, in my lecture. I, I think his account of civil religion is actually quite powerful in terms of reconciling particularity with generality. But I do think that that's something that we have to be on guard against when we think about um, importing Rousseau's political theory in, in, a, in the context of modern nation states. I agree with you. No, um, I agree with you. Maybe I I would be a little more charitable to Rousseau and see that I think that uh, his political theory is um, is not so much about unity and a homo you know a very uh, homogeneous um, uh, social body. And I still I would still think that the notion of communion can be interesting if we relate it to the notion of common interest and here but but here maybe i would um um i would distance myself from the notion of ecstasy like the the ecstasy of patriotic virtue and i'm i'm not sure that Rousseau is so much about that but i think that his insistence on communion could be understood more on we need to find a common interest like we need to find even though you know we may come from very different backgrounds and histories but there are some points and some issues in which it is important to find a common interest in order to keep the body politic alive would you what would you think of this yes yeah, so, so getting kind of technical now but yes i do think that so the common interest is the basis for the general will which is the central political concept in rousseau's political theory it's the basis of all sovereignty and the general will um is is restricted to the common interest that that's that is what gives us the substance of the general will it, it's those interests that we share um now the problem is and the reason he preferred small societies and, and relatively homogeneous societies is because the set of interests that we hold in common grows, well, the analogy, the, the metaphor we use in political theory is it becomes thinner and thinner as the society gets larger and larger and more complicated. So that set of common interests is thinner and thinner. And I believe that Rousseau is skeptical as to whether in those circumstances, the kind of pleasures of Republican citizenship can justify the sacrifice that we make in order to enter into uh, Republican citizenship. So um, I agree with you. I think that's, that's right. I, I think that we can take from Rousseau a kind of lesson about the importance of cultivating commonality. So just I'll make one, you know, when we were having the debate about do we tear down all the, the monuments? How far do we go with that? I think what Rousseau would caution us about is if we're going to live together in one society, we have to have a patriotic narrative. It doesn't have to be the same one that we had previously, um, but we, we want to appreciate the value of a shared narrative um, that, that, that can produce this kind of solidarity, this sense that we are connected to one another, um, because without that, um, the bargain that we make when we uh, agree to the sacrifice um, that I, th I think it was Pierre mentioned, yeah, the bargain that we make just isn't going to be worth it if we can't get that kind of pleasure that's a, that Rousseau associates with the love of the patrie. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I think there, there would be a lot of things to be said about this notion of 
private interest. And I think this is what this is where Rousseau would not stand with many activists today. Um, this is maybe where we need to re rethink um, the defense of minority groups, not as the defense of minority groups, but rephrase this defense of minority rights in a way that means the common interest. But this is my um, my personal intake. Um, Adam Adam Schöne um, has a, a question. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks so much for the great talk, Jason, and, and for organizing the floor. Um, yeah, I just was wondering if you, um, I'm not sure if in your work, I, I just kept thinking of Montaigne as well when you were presenting because I just saw a lot of connections between um, the, yeah, just, well, I guess the part when you were talking about kind of critiquing a philosopher or I think of like Montaigne and uh, sort of like critique of pedantism, uh, pedantic kind of nature of philosophy and, and just this notion of sort of um, the personal and the political intertwined and um, through the autobiographical writing too. So I was wondering if you have looked at them together or see, um, I know that Rousseau and some of the confession and maybe confessions or some of his, there's a few references to Montaigne as well, but um, if you see resonance with them and I don't know, in terms of communion too, like I think of this notion of sovereign friendship within Montaigne, mm -hmm. even though that's more maybe connected to La Boise or, or maybe not quite the same thing as Rousseau, but I just, it's, it's one sort of like connection that I have been um, ruminating on myself and was wondering if you had, had thought about it at all. Yeah, pr probably not too much to add to what you you, you, are, you already know, but it is interesting that the parallel is typically drawn to Augustine's Confessions and not to Montaigne, because especially on that in that area of calling out hypocrisy, Rousseau um, seem, seems to be influenced by Montaigne. The the yeah the the I guess juxtaposing of of his um, worldview to um, that of the kind of his competing writers. I, I mean, it's, I, why does Rousseau, uh, you know, he's, he really is like, a, what, what, what do the young people say? Like these guys do live rent free and he really is worried about them. What, for a guy who says you shouldn't be worried about what other people think of you, he's really preoccupied with distinguishing himself from what they're doing. And then of course you can, this is way above my pay grade, but get into kind of like, why is he doing that? Is, was it because of his experience in Paris? But I agree with you that, that this, the same way Montaigne tries to position himself as, I don't know, more authentic than the other intellectuals. Rousseau is, is, is definitely doing that. Um, and and um, uh, I was gonna say something else, but I forgot. Yeah, but I think you're right. Yeah, I guess we are all um, very tired and <laughs> getting more and more nervous and eager to go back to yeah, the news to know if um, uh, anything uh, has changed. So thank you so much, uh, Jason, for you know, this um, fascinating lecture and discussion. And I hope we can, um, uh, we can continue this uh, discussion uh, at some, um, in, the, in the future, at some point in the future. Thank you so much and um, fingers crossed for, <laughs> for what is going to come. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody.